Welcome to the Kaiser Report. I'm Max Kaiser. You know that feeling when you've blown your life savings on a carnival game and all you have to show for it is a stuffed banana with dreadlocks? Get used to it, because there's no plan B. It's only plan A. Trade your savings, your wealth, your earnings, and get a stuffed banana with dreadlocks. Stacy. <laughs> That's basically the global economy, the global financial system, of course. Now, this guy, New Hampshire man, loses his life savings on Carnival Game. His name was Henry Gribbum, and he lost his life savings of $2,600 on this game where I guess you had to put this ball into a hole, and uh, you, he wanted to win a bigger prize. But what he found is that when he practiced, he says it was easy, but something changed when he started playing for the prize, and the balls kept popping out. It's not possible that it wasn't rigged, said Gribbum. If you were observing this situation, if you were in a situation where you saw it was rigged, would you walk away? Or would you say, hey, I'm going to try to win my money back that I've just lost? Right. Well, this is part of <laughs> economics and behavioral economics. And what Wall Street and other brokers and bankers prey on is on the fallibility of the human psyche that is prone to emotionally get involved in a situation where they're losing money in a rigged market and they are blind to the rigging. They only have an emotional reaction that they want to get their money back. So they're willing to double down on a rigged market. This is what people like Goldman Sachs or JP Morgan or Deutsche Bank in Germany, this is how they make their money. They're very sophisticated casinos in this way. They know that the punters, the people who come in who are losing their life savings, are behaviorally drawn toward this kind of suicide mentality uh, that you see the moths flying into the light and killing themselves. That's the business model of Wall Street. So in this case here, the 30-year-old from Epson says he kept trying to win back his money by going double or nothing. He dropped $300 in just a few minutes, then says he went home to get $2,300 more and soon lost all of that as well. You just get caught up in the whole thing, he said. I've got to win my money back. So, you know, here we have after a financial collapse, a lot of people have lost their homes for, through foreclosure or, or negative equity. They've lost all of their 401k, pension funds, money down in the stock market. So they're doubling down trying to make that money back. And we see that all across the world. The, everybody's diving into the stock market. We see housing bubble again emerging in the United States because people want to win back the money, even though they know it's now a rigged system. Well, let me reintroduce a concept I've talked about on this show before, which is the Martingale betting system. The Martingale betting system, if you go to the casino and you're at the roulette wheel, you bet on red, and if you lose, you double your bet and you bet on red again. And you continue doing this until eventually you will win and you will win, win a bunch of money, but typically more people don't do this because you run out of money a lot quicker than the odds are that you're going to hit the right number and get the money back. Wall Street have been able to legislate and to reshape the way finance is conducted around the world to allow them to engage in martingale betting system. Again, a JP Morgan or a Goldman Sachs, they're constantly doubling down on losing bets because they know, because their source of credit is the Federal Reserve Bank. It's the American taxpayer. And now increasingly it's the global taxpayer and the global banking system. They have an infinite supply of credit at virtually 0% interest rates. They are engaged in the Martingale betting system and they never lose. Whereas this poor guy, the banana man with the dreadlocks, he encounters the, the shortcomings of the Martingale betting system, which is that he can only do one or two throws of the dice, then he's bust, he's bankrupt. He goes home completely without any money. If he were working at JP Morgan, he would continue to do this exact same bet using the house money, using our money, using the, the Federal Reserve, the central bank's money until they made a profit. That's the huge difference between the insiders who are raping the system and everybody else. Well, we could point to two real-world examples of this, long-term capital management. That's when the Fed first got involved in manipulating global interest rates in order to bail out one person. They went bust on a martingale betting technique of doubling down on the Russian ruble. They lost the bet over and over and over until they couldn't sustain the bet anymore. The same thing happened with MF Global. Uh, John Corzine bet on the euro bonds, and he doubled down, doubled down, doubled down. Eventually, the bet went right, but too late for him. Now, but those are when the odds are it's not totally rigged, that their odds are that eventually you might win. Here, in the markets now, 
there's no chance of you winning. The odds are that you will lose on every single thing. Just like with this guy with the banana man, he was never going to win. There's, he could have doubled down for eternity. He would not win because the game was rigged. High-speed traders exploit loophole. High-speed traders are using a hidden facet of the Chicago Mercantile Exchange's computer system to trade on the direction of the futures market before other investors get the same information. Using powerful computers, high-speed traders are trying to profit from their ability to detect when their own trades for certain commodities are executed a fraction of a second before the rest of the market sees the data, traders say. So it's only giving them up to a 10 millisecond advantage but that's enough for them to guarantee profits. Right, it's not enough that they're able to engage in this martingale betting system of guaranteed profits using the central bank's balance sheet as your own. They want more. They want to be able to front run as well as engage in this massive fraud on the martingale betting system story that we're just talking about. So they, they, they're not satisfied with that. This is why the wealth and income gap in the US and around the world is growing so, so much is because so much of the billions and hundreds of billions of dollars per day of trading that goes on is simply either stolen or front run. And of course, that just drains the system of capital that would be used to create jobs, create more balance in the economy, and you'd have less of a risk now of social cohesion risk, as The Economist magazine calls it, or revolution. So according to this article, 61% of all trading on the US stock exchanges is by high frequency traders. So these guys can trade in a fraction of a millisecond. They're just able to go in there way before you front run any trade that you're even thinking of. Um, now, and people keep on getting into the markets though. They see the balls popping up out of the hole. They know it's rigged and they keep on getting in for some reason. Officials with Virtue Financial, a high speed trading firm in New York, view a slight head start as good for the overall market, according to a person familiar with their thinking. The person said the data helps traders who buy and sell futures contracts throughout the day manage risk and post more quotes that benefit other buyers and sellers. The person said Virtue doesn't use the information to amplify its profits by anticipating moves elsewhere in the market. Well, this is, again, a return to the neo-feudalism model. They're using the argument of the divine right of kings, that their profits are, uh, that are gotten illegally by exploiting uh, loopholes and by stealing, they deserve it because they consider themselves to be what are some call market fundamentalisms. They are the, the jihadis of market. They are the, they are the suicide bombers of Chicago and New York. They're exactly equivalent to a, a suicide bomber in a cafe in the Middle East. Then you have a suicide bomber in Chicago or New York. They're cut from the same cloth. They believe in the sanctity of their own narcissism as the guiding light of their actions, and they're killing themselves and others, and that's why uh, we have a big problem. So again, you know, he, the market making and liquidity are the excuses they use over and over. We played that a few years ago where Lloyd Blankfein of Goldman Sachs was interviewed by Charlie Rose. He said that they're market makers. They're just providing liquidity to the market, all these fraudulent CDOs. That was just market liquidity. They, they had no position. Uh, Blythe Masters, who's now under investigation for rigging energy markets, she just said the same thing about silver a few years ago. She said, we're just providing liquidity. We're market makers. We don't take any position. We don't profit from any position. In the article they say proponents say eliminating the ability of parties in a trade to get information slightly in advance could lead to less liquid markets because some firms would be inclined to trade less due to the greater risks. All right. Well, if they were adding liquidity and making markets, then we wouldn't have the problem of flash crashes. Flash crashes exist because there is no genuine liquidity beneath the current bid and offer prices of these many, many markets around the world. And the term making a market or liquidity, when it comes out of the mouth, mouth of a Blythe Masters or someone on Wall Street, again, you have to understand it's code for we worship the god of markets that tell us to commit an act of suicide, whether it's Jim Jones in Guyana or uh, you have uh, Lloyd Blankfein at Goldman Sachs. They're leading their cult leaders into a suicide cult. And market making or liquidity is code for drink the cyanide, blow your brains out, wipe out a village, kill everybody. That's, and they're doing a fantastic job. 
Well, you mentioned flash crashes, and that's in the next headline relating to high-frequency trading. CFTC's Chilton high-speed traders likely made money on Twitter hack attack. So this was, of course, the Twitter hack attack where AP's Twitter account was hacked, and it tweeted out that there was uh, two explosions at the White House, and Barack Obama had been injured. The markets dove $200 billion, wiped off the market cap. He said, quote, it's likely that high-frequency traders made money on the way down and the way up. But there undoubtedly were folks who got caught, lost money, and then couldn't get back in, he said. So again, the balls keep on popping out. The balls keep on popping out. But I'm going to go home and get the rest of my savings and double down to make up the losses for getting trapped out of the markets. Right. People, this high-frequency trading is, is exactly like siphoning gas out of a gas tank. They're using technology to siphon money out of the exchange. That's, the, what's the tech, that's what the technology is used for. The people who are being victimized by this because of behavioral economics, we know that the victim blames themselves. So the people who are losing money in the market are like the beaten wife who blames themselves for the, for, the, for the beatings that they get. Here, uh, the market participants who are victimized are saying, oh my God, I'm, I'm, because of behavioral economics, we know this to be a fact. They blame themselves. And we know that the Wall Street plays onto that, and they, they play onto the psychology here so that people are more likely to blame themselves for the crimes being perpetuated against them. Well, just as the guy at the top of the show where he lost all his life savings for in exchange for a banana with a dreadlocks, he said, you just get caught up in the whole, I've got to win my money back. So then we cut to New York Stock Exchange margin debt approaches all time highs. As the market surges, we inevitably see a sort of Ponzi effect in the market where more confidence breeds more credit and the bidding up of prices. It works until it doesn't. And when it doesn't, the air shore comes out fast. Right, the 885 billion in quantitative easing per month begets 850, almost a trillion dollars in debt, indebtedness, including margin debt and other uh, bond schemes. You see Apple Computer, instead of repatriating the money overseas that they've made and paying a tax on that, which would, they would have had paid a $9 billion tax, which would have gone into the ability of America to create jobs. They're deciding to increase debt because interest rates are low due to the fact that we just mentioned that the central banks around the world are engineering this irrigation-like system of putting money into the pockets of the martingale spinning fraudsters and banksters while depriving the rest of the world of a job and a savings rate and any kind of claim to decency. And this is why people are rising up and getting, you know, toward this notion of a bloody uprising because they've had their dignity stolen from them by Wall Street, by Lloyd Blankfein, by Jamie Dimon. And you mentioned quantitative easing, and I'll finally cut to a quote here from uh, Zero Hedge in a tweet. The level of stupidity of people trying to justify all-time market highs with plunging fundamentals is at QE levels. So again, it's like people accepting all the losses in Vegas in exchange for a free glass of bourbon, or this guy losing his life savings in exchange for a banana with dreadlocks. All right, Stacey Herbert, thanks so much for being on The Kaiser Report. Thank you, Max. All right, that's it for this half of the show. Stay tuned. I'll be back with a whole lot more. Welcome back to the Kaiser Report. I'm Max Kaiser. Time now to turn to Detlev Schlichter, author of Paper Money Collapse. Detlev, welcome back to the Kaiser Report. Thank you very much. Great. The news of the day, Mario Draghi has cut the ECB, cut their rates by 25 basis points. That brings them down to a half a percent, which I guess is the same as Bank of England. What's the update there, your thoughts? Well, I think it's not going to make any main meaningful difference to the, to the European economy. I mean, we had this policy internationally now for, what, five years uh, of interest rate repression, you know, financial repression, keeping interest rates artificially low. This policy is supposed to kickstart the economy to, you know, just give input, impetus to it. It's evidently not working. I mean, the, the, the policy is a failure. In, in, in fact, I think it's now counterproductive because all we're seeing is we're blowing new bubbles in financial markets. I mean, the, the main response you get is in financial assets. Uh, at these kind of interest rates, it's obviously cheaper for banks to, to run big books and, you know, in, in financial assets. We saw after the announcement uh, German government bonds, bonds making new all-time highs. Um, a lot of that, a little bit of that, may ultimately trickle down into the real economy, but, but this, is, uh, uh, you know, this, this is a policy that does, does not work. Let's talk about this phrase, financial repression, for a second. So in other words, you have uh, these rates at half a percent, but the nominal rate of inflation, even 
even when the number that's being reported by these governments, which is understating the number, but let's take their, their number of roughly two and a half, three percent. When, when rates are underneath that level, that opens up this idea of repression, doesn't it? Because people's, uh, people are, especially also when you have a situation where wage growth is only maybe one percent a year. So wages uh, and the savings rates are materially underneath even this low nominal rate of inflation. So right there, out of the box, people are losing, losing their purchasing power, and they're being repressed, you could say. And that's kind of where the genesis of that term comes from. Can you elaborate on that some more? Well, first of all, I think it simply means that a central bank's doing everything they can to not allow the market to set interest rates and, and risk premiums. I mean, I, I, it's fair to say that I think on many of these assets, the yields on these assets are lower than they would be if we had not this financial policy from the central banks. And I think many risk premiums on financial assets, on corporate bonds or on, on equities, would be higher if, if we didn't have that policy. So the idea is to establish prices and, and yields uh, that are not set by the market, but by you know, central bankers. Uh, this should encourage people to spend and to you know, or borrow and invest. Um, uh, but I think that uh, you know, I think the problems we simply have after the crisis, a lot of people feel they have too much. On you know, corporations, feel they have too much debt, and individuals feel they have too much debt. People went through a boom-bust cycle already. So I think uh, it's okay, understandable kind of, that no. people don't want to take up the cheap money and, and and do the same thing again. Although central bankers do everything in their power to encourage them to do just that. No, let me just pick up. There's two ways to grow an economy. You can borrow to invest, or you can spend money in terms of capital expenditure, and you could save money in terms of developing a savings rate. Uh, and, and this idea where we're not going to have capital expenditures, we're going to re rely on consumer culture. 70% of the economy here is consumer culture. It's going to be funded by people borrowing money. Uh, and it's resulting in, as we were saying, asset bubbles in now stocks and in real estate, but no genuine growth in terms of the underlying economy, the participation rate of labor, for example, in the United States is still at a, as lo, uh, the low, we have to go back to the 1970s That's to right. find it as low as it is now. Wages are barely uh, moving at all. Uh, the, 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 the fabric of the economy is still falling apart because there's a choice. The choice is for borrowing to speculate instead of investing, essentially, and capital creation. So that, that's, a, that's a conscious choice. And it's a choice that so far has resulted in not in any meaningful growth, but only these asset bubbles. So at what point do politicians need to say, we made the wrong choice, we need to make another choice? Well, I think the, the point is now. I think they should stop this policy right away and, and, and stop these, this manipulation of markets. But they're doubling down. They're increasing quantitative easing. They're amplifying their mistakes. I think that's absolutely correct. I think the central banks painted themselves into a corner now because they don't dare stop this kind of policy and Draghi has even hinted a okay. negative reinterest rate. So Draghi they, they, over there at the ECB, which is, the, let's call, say where it is, it's the Bundesbank. I mean, they're, they're, they're being sucked in to this, this idea, like, totally against the DNA of your German central banker. They are now going to expand the ECB's balance sheet by trillions of euros to compete with the US and the UK. The German people, they must be outraged at this because they're, they're going to watch there. They're going to go right back into a hyperinflationary scenario, right? Ultimately, this could very well lead into a hyperinflationary scenario. Now, strangely right now, I think it's, it's causing bubbles in Germany. And, and I think what we see right now is something that we saw the flip side of back in 2003 to 2005, when the interest rates were also very low, to help our Germany at the time. And that helped to build all these bubbles in southern Europe, in particular the, you know, the real estate market in Spain, where now it's the reverse. Now we have even lower interest rates to help southern Europe. And now we see you know, Germany now, on paper, looks better than it, it really is fundamentally and in terms of its underlying economics. We see right now Germans lowering their savings rate. We see Germans entering the real estate market. We have a real estate boom in Germany. So if this all continues, we will see new bubbles pop up somewhere else. I think if you step back there, there's only, we have to keep in mind, your know, consumption ultimately has to be backed by production and investing is ultimately to be, be backed by saving. You can disengage these components for some time by just printing money, expanding credit, or some, simply on money creation and leverage. And this is what we did, you know, again and again, most recently up to 2007, 2008, and we're trying to do that again. And uh, this will only lead, again, further to bubbles, which will pop at some stage and we go into another financial crisis. Or at some point, this policy will undermine the confidence in money, and then you do get 
a higher velocity of money, you do get inflation, and then we're really in a mess. Okay, so one of the price signals people look for to see whether or not these central banks are making a mistake or not would be the price of gold. Yes. Now, gold in this recent news cycle has actually traded down on the news. There was a, a bit of a flash crash in gold. Uh, they fell suddenly in April. Um, so this is being pointed to by those that are on the side of the paper pushers, as I call them, as vindication that they're correct. Then on the other side of the coin, you have folks that are pointing out that, well, gold, like whether it's LIBOR or whether it's Blythe Masters and the oil energy markets, it's manipulated and it's giving a false price signal. There's scarcity of gold. Um, what's going on in the gold in relation to all this? Whether the price is manipulated or not is, is difficult to say. So I, I don't want to even enter that discussion. I take it at face, face value. So I think if you look at it, is there a reason why the gold price is trading down? And I think we can find these reasons in the, you know, at least short term reasons. Um, I think what's happening is that so far the policy of this all this money printing has not led to uh, substantial rises in consumer price inflation, which is really what most people look at. It is leading again to inflation in asset prices, but not in consumer prices. So this is something I think where the holders of gold, some of them, are getting nervous. You know, this is not leading to the inflationary impact that many of them expected. And secondly, I think uh, the the central bankers enjoying are enjoying a little bit of a sweet spot right now in the markets, in the sense that the money they're creating is leading to these um, uh, asset price appreciations. And that sucks more and more people again into the equity market. And I think a lot of investors find it difficult to sit on gold uh, when sort of the equity market is rallying and even the bond market is rallying and all financial assets are going up. So I think we have you know, these phenomena. In inflation is fairly contained right now because the economy is not really picking up. Financial assets are booming again. And so people feel that gold is a little bit of a dead weight in uh, their portfolio. I don't think this will last because, as we said before, um, you know, the, this policy is, doesn't, doesn't get us out of, out of our problems. It, it will create new problems uh, as we go along. Right. Well, they say one thing about gold, but then when uh, trouble begins, then they have a different attitude toward gold. So during the Cyprus bail-in, it was suggested that Cyprus sell their gold reserves to secure a loan. Now it's being suggested that Italy issue gold-backed bonds to monetize their, their gold, essentially. So gold, uh, during the course of this crisis period, is inching toward something called an international reserve currency. This is being used now by banks to square the books on some of these countries like Italy and Cyprus and others. So is it, is it the case where it's, um, you know, follow what we do, but don't follow what we say? Because behind the scenes, it seems gold is now becoming increasingly more important. Your thoughts? Uh, I think gold is becoming more important and will continue to become more important for people simply as a self-defense asset. I mean, I call it as the essential self-defense asset to, to protect your own assets and your own wealth from inflation and, and other you know, further financial crises and all this manipulation that we're discussing here. Um, I, I think among the, the officials and central banks and, and governments, it, it is, it's, it's not that important because obviously, if you look at the balance sheets of the major central banks now, you know, the leverage in the financial system, it's so big that their gold holdings as collateral is, is almost meaningless. I mean, the biggest owner of gold uh, officially is obviously the United States, and their official gold holdings amount to, what I think, 400 billion but, but, but uh, US dollars. And, and, but, and the but Fed me, is printing that in, 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 in the course of three or four months. Yeah, uh, let, me, let me jump in for a second, because uh, less and less countries now, their sovereign debt is considered AAA. So AAA credits are now in scarce supply as far as collateral goes, as far as being able to collateralize the interbank lending schemes that are going around to support this multi-hundred trillion dollar derivatives market, there's very few AAA rated credits now. That's correct, yeah. Gold is uh, uh, something without any counterparty risk. It is actually collateral, and we see during market sell-offs, suddenly people dump gold because it's the only thing out there where there's a bid. That's correct. The only thing that somebody will take in exchange to extinguish a debt or a derivative gone bust is gold. I want to talk about China for a second. The GLD, which is that ETF, trades in New York. It sold 271 tons of gold year to date as part of this sell-off. Now, conversely, Chinese housewives, the mythical Mrs. Wang, uh, bought 300 tons in two weeks. Which, which is a more important trend here? Difficult to say. I'd probably say neither because, you know, if what? we take... That's heresy! 
No, no. I, I, I would say, I would say the uh, you know, the reason why I think gold will continue to do well in the medium to long run is simply because of what we discussed earlier, that these central banks will continue to print money. And that should be a good reason for the Chinese, whether domestic or official, to buy more gold. And it should be uh, a, a strong reason in the medium to long term for those investors in the, in the gold ETFs to, to continue to buy gold. Uh, so in a way, I think uh, these are well, which group of investors is currently buying or selling gold, I think these are short-term tactical factors that I think in the long term do not make much of a difference for the outlook of the gold market. I will say one more thing about Cyprus and the central banks selling gold or using it as collateral. I think what we could see in some of these cases is that they're selling it like you know the family silver, just liquidating it because they, they are insolvent or close to getting insolvent, so they need to liquidate assets. Again, in the short term, this could be a dampening factor on the gold price. In the long run, none of these factors are material. The key factor is that paper money is continued to be used as a political tool to keep you know, an overstretched financial system going, and, and, and ultimately that's going to debase um, you know, fiat money. Okay, so not much faith in Mrs. Wang, Detlev. Well, we're going to have to cut it off there. We're out of time. Thanks so much for being on the Kaiser Report. Thanks for having me. Thank you. And that's going to do it for this edition of the Kaiser Report with me, Max Kaiser, and Stacey Herbert. I want to thank my guest, Detlev Schlichter. If you'd like to send us an email, please do so at kaiserreport at rttv.ru. Until next time, Max Kaiser saying bye, y'all.